People have a lot of questions about the economy, about uh, our entire system of capitalism. And, and gentlemen, let me ask each of you, over the course of the last year, was there ever a time that you had doubts about capitalism and about our way of life? No, there, there was not a time. If there had been last September when we invested a lot of money, that was, that was when the country was looking into the abyss. And, uh, you know, the money was flowing out of money market funds, the commercial paper market died and everything. We, we put $8 billion to work in, in a, just a matter of a, a few days then. So I never lost confidence in the system. Uh, this country works. You know, we've got 200 years of, of, of proof, and uh, it's going to continue to work. And Bill, what do you think, Bill? Well, we, we have a complex financial system, which we've proven that we can make mistakes. But more fundamental than that is the innovation, the fact that you can create new companies, that people are willing to take risk and invest, that there's great science going on. You know, this country still has the best universities, the best science, and, you know, we're going to tune our system of capitalism. Uh, you know, the idea that you have a lot of short-term loans covering long-term needs, uh, the amount of leverage that was there, there are definitely some lessons. But the fundamentals of the system, a marketplace-driven system where we invest in education and a, a great infrastructure for the long term, that's continued. And you know, I bet there's inventions that took place even that fall in that darkest hour. People were working on new drugs, new chips, new robots and things that will make life better uh, for everyone in the decades ahead. Why don't we start out and get right to it? Um, why don't you start out? You ready to go? Sure. Okay. My question is addressed to both Mr. Gates and Mr. Buffett. I'd like to know your perspective on the claim that greed and unethical or immoral business practices were at the root cause of the financial crisis. Well, it certainly played a part, but we've always had greed. That, that did not get invented in the last few years. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, greed, fear, in the in the third quarter i mean the, the the american people were were really panicked there for a while and it affected their it started out on wall street but then it spilled over into the general economy subsequently but we're never going to get rid of greed we're never going to get rid of fear what we do have is a system as bill said a market system but beyond that we have a quality of opportunity we have a rule of law all of those things have combined to unleash human potential in this country over the last couple of hundred years to a degree that no one would have believed possible a few centuries before that. And there's nothing that's gone wrong with that system. Our, our economy was sputtering and still is sputtering some, but we've got the greatest engine ever devised and it's, it's just beginning. So uh, 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 greed will continue. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Uh, uh, Oliver Stone is is uh, putting out a second film here pretty soon. <laughs> Probably get mentioned again in this one uh, uh, with Gordon Gecko uh, making a return. But that is not what drives the American system. What drives the American system is this equality of opportunity in a market system and, and the knowledge that when you get out of here, you're going to enjoy the fruits of, of, of the knowledge you've gained and it, it will keep working. I'd love to trade places with any of you. <laughs> Bill, do you have any extra thoughts on that? Well, the, the best systems are ones where you have good short-term metrics, you know, great accounting, looking at profits, looking at risk, and a willingness to do things long-term, you know, in, investing in new research, uh, letting people build new companies. I was a huge beneficiary of this country's unique willingness to take risk on a young person, and, you know, I got to hire people who were older, I got to sell to uh, people who were older, and it was, it was kind of a, a dream come true. And that kind of thing is, other countries have seen it, and they're trying to create that same dynamic. And that's good for the world. It's excellent that China and India will borrow uh, our ideas about universities, about entrepreneurship, simplification of business. You know, none of us want to borrow this extreme leverage that we got into. Uh, but it, in a sense, that's kind of a, I don't want to say minor, but it doesn't speak to the, the heart of, of why things have worked so well. All right, let's get to another question. How about right here? Yeah. Hello, my name is Akosia Bajma. I am from the Northern Virginia area, and I'm a first year student here at Columbia. Um, and I want to thank you once again, both of you, for coming. It's an honor. Um, my question is directed towards Mr. Gates. 
Um, so, Mr. Gates, I know you're not in the finance industry, but can you tell us what you were feeling when you first heard that Lehman was filing for bankruptcy? You know, I don't follow investment banks, you know, very closely. Uh, so it didn't strike me as fundamentally a terrible thing. In the technology business, the, the two companies I had admired the most, Wang Industries and Digital Equipment, had both basically gone bankrupt. Digital actually got bought. And so the fact that there's these ups and downs, certain firms get knocked out, you know, I, I didn't have any sentimentality over that uh, particular firm. Now, this knock-on effect where other people had debts to them and those were going to be very hard to settle and that complexity might uh, cause things to freeze up. That I called up Warren and I said, you know, should I be worried? And he said, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> Warren, was it a mistake for the government to allow Lehman to go under? Uh, it may have been, uh, but I would say that overall the, the officials in Washington did, did a terrific job of dealing with uh, uh, really what was an economic Pearl Harbor, as we talked about then. So uh, I would say that, that if Merrill hadn't got bought by the B of A, uh, Merrill would have gone very quickly. And, you know, the dominoes were really lined up. And I don't think it was fully appreciated, perhaps, what a big domino Lehman was or how close it was to the, ne to the next big dominoes. Uh, but overall, I give, I give Paulson, I give Bernanke, I give Sheila Bear, I give Tim Geithner, I give them very high marks for the fact that they took unprecedented actions. Hi, my name is Brian Finn. I'm a, a first year student here at Columbia. And I, we're at a business school right now. And it seems to me a lot of the villains in this whole credit crisis were, uh, were business school graduates. To what extent do you guys think that, that business schools like Columbia were in some sense, account or responsible for what for what transpired in the credit crisis. Well, remember that capitalism has been massively successful. You know, standard of life, medicine, all these great things have come out of it. And business schools play a role in training people to think about value, uh, leadership. Uh, there's wonderful skills that are taught at great schools like this. And so the fact that, yes, we've had a crisis and we've dropped back, you know, maybe we wasted two or three years net uh, because of the, the things that were done wrong, that doesn't say that business schools aren't performing a, a great service. You know, the case studies of this crisis will be taught here uh, for decades to come, and so at least we'll get that benefit out of uh, the pain we went through. Leverage is a very dangerous thing, and, and perhaps... Uh, you know, Warren talked about derivatives as, of, as weapons of mass destruction. Uh, that wasn't much heated, and yet at the end of the day, what happened here was, in, particularly in the real estate sector, the, the notion of risk that price would drop down and what that meant systemically for those instruments, it wasn't well understood, and the mass destruction uh, followed as, as predicted. Warren, can you teach ethics in a business school, or does it have to come from somewhere else? Pardon? I think I think it's I think the best place to learn ethics is in the home. I mean, that's, I think most of us get our values from what we see around us before we get to business school. I, I think that it's important to emphasize them, but I, I, I think that if I had a choice of having great education on ethics early on in the home or a, as a course in the in the school later on, I would I would choose the home. But uh, uh, the wonderful thing about it is in this country is. You can succeed magnificently with ethics. I mean, it, it, it's not a hindrance. I mean, it, it, it's a help sometimes, it's a neutral sometimes, but it's not a hindrance at all. And, and uh, uh, to cut corners, you know, and everybody here has a wonderful future. I mean, this is, a, this is a, an economy you're going into that's so much better. <laughs> If you look back on the, if you look back on the 19th century, we we had seven great bank panics. I mean, if you look back at the 20th century, we had the Great Depression and world wars and flu epidemics. I mean, this this country doesn't avoid problems; it just solves them. And 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 in the next hundred years, our machine will sputter again. You know, and maybe 15 years will be so-so years, but there'll be 85 great years. And during the 20th century, the Dow went from 66 to 11,400. So this is fertile soil that you're working in, and there's no reason to cut corners. All right, perfect. Let's get another question.
Hi, uh, my name is Ksenia Genkina, and I was born in Russia, and I'm now a second year student at Columbia Business School. Uh, my question is for Mr. Gates. What industry do you think is going to produce the next Bill Gates? Because that's the industry I want to get a job in. <laughs> Industries do have different paces of innovation. And so the IT industry, driven by the magic of software, the magic of the optic fiber, magic of the chip, which doubles in power every couple of years, it's been the industry that has not only been the most exciting, it's also changed the rules for many other industries. You know, the idea of uh, information being available, what the online world is like, that's incredible. I'd say there are a few other industries that will compete for being exciting in the decades ahead. The energy business, uh, some approach uh, will provide cheaper energy that's environmentally friendly. And there's a lot of science, a lot of business. That's a global thing. There'll be some great careers there. Uh, medicine, you know, we haven't solved Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or about 20 diseases of these poor countries. And yet, we can be sure that we're on track to do that. And so, you know, those three industries, I think you would do great in. There's, there's many others, but those are the ones that have the, the strongest appeal to me. But find, the, find what turns you on. I mean, find what you have a passion for. That if somebody had said to me when I was getting out of Columbia, you know, that Bill's business was going to be the one that was going to be exciting, you know, I'd, I don't think I'd have done so well. <laughs> but I, I knew what turned me on. I had a professor here, Ben Graham. I offered to go to work for him for nothing. He said, you're overpriced. And, but nevertheless, I, I went into the business. And... and <laughs> You, I will guarantee you, you will do well at whatever turns you on. It, mm -hmm. it, 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 there's no question about that. Uh, don't, let it, don't, let it, don't let anybody else tell you what to do. You, mm -hmm. you figure out when, when you're doing something. Right. Bill, do you share that sense of optimism? Oh, absolutely. Uh, capitalism is great at having thousands of things go on in parallel. And you know, a lot of them fail. Some are just mediocre. But the ones that are special... Uh, can grow and, and you know, stun everybody. And in all those fields I've mentioned, there's going to be several companies that kind of take your breath away. All right, let's get to another student question. Hi, my name is Lisa Williams. I'm from South Orange, New Jersey. I'm currently a first year at the MBA program. Glad to have you both here. My question is actually for Mr. Buffett. There's been a lot of discussion around the true drivers for the recent deal with Burlington Northern. And I was wondering if you could share with us your key motivation for wanting to increase exposure to the railroad sector at this time. Yeah, well, you know, when I was six, I wanted a railroad set. And my dad didn't get it. <laughs> If you think about it, uh, the railroads are tied to the future prosperity of this country. You can't move a railroad to China or India or anyplace else. So we start out with the premise, and I, I can't think of a more sound premise, that there will be more people in this country 10, 20, 30 years from now. They'll be moving more and more goods back and forth to each other. And, and you have the most environmentally friendly and the most cost-efficient way of doing that on the railroads. Uh, uh, the Burlington Northern last year moved, on average, it moved a ton of freight 470 miles on one gallon of diesel. You know, that is far, far more efficient than what takes place over the highways. You have, a, you have a situation where overall they use a third less fuel, they put far fewer pollutants into the, into the atmosphere than trucks will. One, one train will supplant 280 trucks or so on the road. So, so the rails are in tune with the future and there's uh, I like the West. I like the 30-some thousand miles of, of, of roadway that, that Burlington has. And, and uh, you know, if, if this country has a poor future, the rails have a poor future. And I, I'm willing to bet a lot of money, that $34 billion to be specific, <laughs> <laughs> on the fact that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, there'll be more and more goods being moved by rail. And it'll be better for the country. And it'll be better for the shareholders of, of, of the Burlington Northern. Okay. I see another question. Hi, my name is uh, Josh Porter. I'm a first year from North Reading, Massachusetts. Uh, it's an honor to have you both here. Um, so we just went through the worst financial crisis of hopefully all of our lifetime. <clears throat> 
and I know it keeps a lot of Americans up at night, you know, worrying about their future. Um, what, if anything, keeps uh, either of you up at night? I, I try to live my life so nothing does keep me up at night. <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> I don't, I, I don't like to sound, uh, you know, like a mortician during an epidemic or anything, but, but last fall was really quite exciting for me. I mean, I, 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 don't wish it on, I don't wish it on anybody, but there were things being offered. There, there were opportunities for us to do things that didn't exist a year or two earlier. Uh, uh, so I, I really don't, I don't want to be in a position where I'm leveraged or something of the sort that does keep me up at night. And I did not worry about the ultimate survival of, of our economic system. I, we were messed up. Wasn't any question about that. But the plants hadn't gone away. The cornfields hadn't gone away. The talent of the American people hadn't gone away. The innovativeness of the next Bill Gates hadn't gone away. This country was going to do fine. I knew that. We just had to get things straightened out. And, and we're well on the way to having that happen. Bill, you mentioned the, yeah. You mentioned before that you called Warren and he said, yeah, we should maybe be a little worried. Did you, did you stay up late that night worrying about it? No. The financial system, fortunately, uh, good leadership has a lot of self-correction built into it. I think there are a few things uh, that could surprise us uh, that are negative. Uh, you know, a big terrorist event sometime in the next 20 years, that would be a, a big negative. And a pandemic, which we're actually having in terms of the rate of spread of a new flu one right now. And fortunately, its actual impact is very modest, uh, way less than, than any such thing. So you, you have to keep your eye out for a few outliers like that, and those are the two that, that I would point to. But overwhelmingly, the, the rest of the system, you know, the, there is self-correction built into it. The long-term thing that I, I don't lose sleep over, but I worry about is that we do have our education system, uh, particularly the K through 12 part, not improving as much as we should. And it, it's an important system for opportunity. It's an important system for uh, the economic strength of the country. And since it hasn't improved that much, that, that's a bit scary and needs a lot more attention. But Becky, if you had, if you, if, if you had a wonderful farm and you knew in the next 50 years there'd be five droughts, but there'd be 45 good years. I mean, you, you, would, you, would not, you would not become paralyzed thinking about the five drought years. You, you, you would recognize that you've got a system that works very well over time, and that's our American economic system. Since we just had the drought year, does that make it less likely for the no, to be another no, one if, really quickly? No, if, you, if you'd study statistics at Columbia, you'd recognize that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get to another question. Right back here. Hi, uh, I'm Peter Lawrence, a first year uh, student from Columbia. Um, and, it, and first of all, thank you both uh, so much for coming here. Uh, Mr. Buffett, um, the recent run up in the market has been historic, and it seems that many people question the sustainability of the current price level. Um, do, do you think the rally is for real? <laughs> what, what's going to happen tomorrow, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, <laughs> Let me, let me give you an illustration. I, I bought my first stock in 1942. I was 11, and I'd, I'd been dilly-dallying up to then, but I got serious. <laughs> and what do you think the best year for the market has been since 1942, best calendar year, from 1942 to the present time? Well, I'll, there's no reason you'd know the answer, but the answer is 1954. And in 1954, the Dow counting dividends was up 50%. Now, if you look at 1954, we were in a recession a good bit of that time. Uh, the recession started in July of 53. Unemployment peaked in September of 54. So until November of 54, you hadn't seen an, an uptick in the employment figure. And the unemployment figure more than doubled during that period. It was the best year that was for the market. So it's a terrible mistake to look at what's going on in the economy today and then decide whether to buy or sell stocks based on it. You should decide whether to buy or sell stocks based on how much you're getting for your money, long-term value you're getting for your money at any given time. And next week doesn't make any difference because next week, next week is gonna be a week further away. And the important thing is to have a, the right long-term outlook, evaluate the businesses you're buying, and then a terrible market or a terrible economy is your friend. And, and uh, uh, I don't care in making a purchase of the Burlington Northern, I don't care whether next week or next month or even next year, there's a big revival in car loadings or any, uh, that sort of thing. 
a period like this gives me a chance to do things. And uh, it, it's, it's silly to wait. I, I, I wrote an article. If you, if you wait till you see the Robin, spring will be over. My name is Erica Braley, and I'm a second year student. My question is for Mr. Gates. What is the most important thing you do every day? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my days have a lot of variety. I think reading a lot, uh, you know, and, and continuing to learn. Uh, you know, I'm in a lot of new areas in the foundation, education, uh, health, uh, and and I love reading a lot. So I think you know, arming myself with that knowledge, and then sitting down with people who live the topic and brainstorming with them. Uh, that that's what helps me back uh, the right people and and make sure I know what's going on. So I guess I'd say learning is what, what the that. key thing. <laughs> All right, let's get to another question. Mr. Buffett, Mr. Gates, thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Justin Heyman. I'm a second year MBA. And as I get ready to graduate, I was wondering, what's the one thing that your MBA didn't prepare you for when you got out to the real world? Well, I, I was, it prepared me very well. Not the whole degree, but specific professors <laughs> prepared me very well for what I was, uh, uh, what I wanted to go into. I knew I was interested in investing, like I say, from the time I was six or seven years of age. So I was lucky that I found what turned me on early on. And I had these two marvelous professors here at, at Columbia that, uh, that just being around, I'd read all the stuff they'd written. And, and so it wasn't I was acquiring lots of incremental knowledge but I was getting inspired, and they were terrific to me. Dave Dodd treated me like a son. He'd take me out to dinner and everything. Ben Graham did the same thing for me. So that, it gave me confidence in myself. It, 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 it just propelled me in, into a field I already loved with, with, with this terrific tailwind from these professors that believed in me. Uh, I, 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 let me add one point because to the MBA situation. Uh, right now, I would pay $100,000 for 10% of the future earnings of any of you. So anybody <laughs> wants to see me after this, it's over. And, uh, <laughs> now, <laughs> now if, if that's true, you're a million dollar asset right now, right? If 10% of you is worth 100,000. You could improve the value, most, many of you, and I certainly could have when I got out. If, just in terms of learning communication skills. You know, it's not something that's taught. I, I actually went to a Dale Carnegie course later on in terms of public speaking. But, but if you improve your value 50% by having better communication skills, that's, you know, it's another $500,000, you know, in terms of capital value. See me after the class and I'll pay you, you know, 150. <laughs> You, you bring up your time here, and I don't know if you can see the monitors back here, but we did take a look at your yearbook and steal your picture from 1951 here. Uh -oh. I think we've got a picture in the back of the monitors. There you are. <laughs> okay. I, I don't think I'd pay 100000 for 10% of that guy. <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Oleg Chish. I'm a second year MBA student here. Uh, my question is for Mr. Gates. You obviously worked very hard to get to uh, where you are, but could you reflect on what role pure luck played in your success? Well, I, I was lucky in many ways. I was lucky to be born with certain skills. Uh, I was lucky to have parents that created an environment where they shared what they were working on and, and let me buy as many books as I wanted to. And then I was lucky in terms of the timing. The invention of the microprocessor was something profound. And it turned out only if you were kind of young and looking at that could you appreciate what it meant. And then I'd been obsessed with writing software. And it turned out that was the key missing thing that would allow the microprocessor to have this incredible impact. So in timing and skill set, in some of the people I was lucky enough to meet, uh, you know, meeting Bourne, uh, talking to him, learning from him. I, it's, it's unusual uh, to have so much luck uh, in one life, I think. But it, it's been a major factor in, in what I've been able to do. Excellent. All right, another question right here. Hello, my name is Yu Jung Kim. I'm from Deerfield, Illinois, and I'm a first-year student here at Columbia Business School. I'd like to direct my question to both Mr. Buffett and Mr. Gates. 
In the context of both your professional relationship and unique friendship, what do you admire most about each other? Hmm. Okay, who wants to take that one first? <laughs> uh, it's my athletic ability admires. You may not say that. <laughs> well, I would, I would say what I really most admire about Bill is, is, is the view he has about what, what, he, uh, what he should do uh, with, with the wealth he's accumulated. I mean, as he said, he was very lucky. He was born in the right country at the right time, you know, the right wiring and all of that sort of thing. But in the end, he knows he's a beneficiary of a, of a uh, terrific society, and not everybody gets uh, the long straws like, like he and I did. So he is, and he has this view that every human life worldwide is the equivalent of every other human life. And he's backing it up, not only with money, but he's backing it up with his time, and, and his wife Melinda's backing it up with his, her time, and, and they are really going to spend you know, the last half of their lives or so using both money, talent, energy, imagination, all to improving the lives of six and a half billion people around the world. And that's what I admire the most. Bill? Well, with Warren, there's a lot of things you could pick. Uh, you know, his integrity as an example for the world, uh, his sense of humor. Uh, but I think I, I'd pick his desire to teach, his desire to take things that are complex and put them in a simple form uh, so that people can understand and get the benefit of all his experience, all his under models of how the world works. He loved to, loves to teach, and he does it meeting with students. He does it in his annual newsletter. He does it when he's talking to me on the phone. It's, it's a real gift that uh, I admire incredibly. Here, here. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Uh, my name is Kevin Van Dam, and I'm a first year student here. And uh, this question is for Mr. Buffett. Um, if the Burlington Northern uh, acquisition is any indication of uh, your long term buy and hold forever uh, investment philosophy, I'm wondering if the financial crisis has impacted that philosophy or your investment process in any way? No, it, it hasn't changed at all. I mean, we, we like products like this. How's this for shameless product? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. This, this started in 1886. You know, it's gone through all of these events, and in the end, you know, there will be 1.6 billion eight-ounce servings of Coca-Cola products drunk today, and there'll be more next year and the year after. So we want to be in businesses with durable, competitive advantage managements we like and trust, and. And do them at a price we like, and uh, it does. It hasn't. It hasn't changed it a tenth of a degree. And incidentally, we own Fruit of the Loom too, but I'm not going to do it properly. <laughs> okay, our next question right here. Hi, I'm Brian Diefenbacher. I'm a second year student. Uh, Mr. Buffett, it's great to see you again. I was on the trip to Omaha last month. Thank you for hosting us. My question is, how would you recommend an individual investor who follows a Graham and Dodd philosophy to allocate their capital today? Well, if they, it depends whether they're going to be an active investor. Uh, Graham distinguished between the defensive and the enterprising investor. If you're going to spend a lot of time on investment, you know, I just advise looking at as many things as possible and you will find some bargains. And, and, uh, and when you find them, you have to act. Uh, uh, it doesn't. It doesn't. It, it hasn't changed at all since I was here in 1951, uh, 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 and it won't change the rest of my life. So you just you start turning pages. When I got out of school, I turned every page in Moody's, 10,000 some pages twice, you know, looking for companies. And you have to find them yourself. The world isn't going to tell you about great deals. You, you have to find them yourself, and that takes a fair amount of time. So if you're not going to do that, if you're just going to be a passive investor, then I just advise an index fund bought consistently over a long period of time. The one thing I will tell you is that the worst investment you can have is cash. Everybody's talking about cash being king and all that sort of thing, but I, most of you don't look like you're overburdened with cash anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it uh, you know, cash is going to become worth less over time, but good businesses are going to become worth more over time, and you don't want to pay too much for them, so you have to have some discipline about, about what you pay. Uh, 
But the thing to do is find a good business and stick with it. Does that mean you think that we are through the roughest times? Of, uh, you, you'd always kept a cash flow around, too. Well, that... we, we always keep enough cash around so I feel very comfortable and don't worry about sleeping at night. But, uh, but it's not because I like cash as an investment. Uh, cash is a bad investment over time. Uh, 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 but you always want to have enough so that nobody else can determine your future, essentially. I, the worst, the financial panic is behind us. The economic spillout, which came to some extent from that financial panic, is, is, it's, it's still with us. It will end. I don't know whether it'll end tomorrow or next week or next month uh, or maybe a year, but it, it won't go on forever. And to sit around and try and pick the bottom, people were trying to do that last March, and, and you know the bottom hadn't come in unemployment, the bottom hadn't come in business, but the bottom had come in stocks. So, don't pass up something that's attractive today because you hope you're going to find something way more attractive tomorrow. Okay. Another question right here. Mr. Buffett, Mr. Gates, my name is Antoinette Genovese. I'm a first-year executive MBA student, and I actually work at Goldman Sachs. So thank you for your investment. <laughs> Why aren't you at work? <laughs> Um, my question to you is I'd like both of your thoughts on the development of alternative energy as um, for developing our economy and um, getting it back on track. Bill, you touched on this earlier. Well, there are many, many ideas, and there's enough that we can say most of them will turn out to be dead ends. Uh, you know, the solar thermal, sol solar electric, uh, nuclear is going to go through somewhat of a revival and see if it can solve some of its cost challenges. As a country, we want to make sure all of those get lots of R&D and regulatory enablement because one of them is going to give us much cheaper power without uh, causing any problem. We don't know which one it is, and we don't have quite as much R&D going in, into those things as I'd like to see. We have quite a bit, but I think uh, the government policies could drive for more. But it is one of these areas that's somewhat faddish in nature. And whenever you have a lot of energy focusing on a field, the amount of money that goes in is very large. And the overall return on capital is often quite low. The car industry in its heyday was a d disaster. The airline industry, even the software industry, because people don't remember all the non-Microsofts that uh, don't exist till today. When something's hot, you get uh, kind of those bubbles. So energy, you're going to have to be a bit careful to uh, make sure it's one that's really got its cost structure in line and it's not just being pushed along by, by subsidies and th there'll be scientific surprises. So a very hot area, but not necessarily a good area for investment. What's the question that you'd like to pose? to Mr. Gates and Mr. Buffett. Well, thanks, uh, Becky, and thanks to both of you for being here today, and Warren, welcome home. Thank you. To, uh, <laughs> this is but, Warren, one thing you said years ago that's always stuck with me is you, know, you never know who's swimming naked till the tide goes out. And that, of course, uh, says maybe there's some value in knowing when it's going to be low tide. Uh, it also says there's value in knowing context. How do we develop, how do we encourage business leaders to understand context and connect the dots? Well, I think, I think they've learned a lot about that in the last year, and some, some never learn. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, you, I have... At Berkshire, we have actually 70-some managers, and uh, I think they're, most of them are a fair amount smarter than they were 15 months ago, but they were plenty smart to go in. And, and, uh, but I, I, you know, I think that what I learned from a Ben Graham, who, who came up here every Thursday afternoon, he didn't need to do it, you know, the, he donated whatever he got paid back to the school and all of that, but uh, having sound principles takes you through everything. And, and, and the bedrock principles that really I learned from Graham and Dodd, uh, I haven't had to do anything with them. I mean, they, they, they take me through good periods, they take me through bad periods, and, and uh, in the end, I don't worry about them because I know they work. Bill, what do you think is the most important character for a business leader to have? Well, it's surprising that the fundamentals of business are pretty straightforward. You know, you try to take more in an income than you spend in cost, and 
You know, that's a, a pretty straightforward subtraction. But it's, it's surprising in terms of projecting out into the years ahead that, you know, are we making the right investments? Are we gaining on the competition? Are we making it a little bit harder uh, for people to replace what we're doing? That kind of common sense, I guess you've got to develop it through experience. And, you know, I think it's neat if you're young, you can see that in a small scale uh, and be hands-on with it because a lot of people who start with large businesses may have a hard time with it. So, you know, the, the basics are, are pretty straightforward. Uh, learning how it, how it works and doesn't work in a variety of industries uh, by reading a lot, I think that's, you know, something that comes with time and a business school is an intense period where you can uh, get ahead of the game. I send one message out every year and a half or two years to the max. They get one letter from me every couple of years and it basically it says, run this business like it's the only business that your family can own for the next hundred years. You can't sell it, but every year, don't measure it by the earnings in that quarter of that year. Measure it by whether the moat around that business, what gives it competitive advantage over time has widened or narrowed. And if you keep doing that for a hundred years, it's gonna work out very well. And then I tell them, basically, if the reason for doing something is everybody else is doing it, it's not good enough. I mean, if you have to use that as a reason, forget it. You haven't got a good reason for doing something, so never use that. Okay, let's get to some student questions. Mr. Beckett, Mr. Gates, it's absolutely fantastic having you here. Thanks a lot. My name is Katya Karpuchina. I'm a second year MBA student here at Columbia. And actually, my question is really related to what you were asking. Mm -hmm. So many of us and many people in general aspire to become somebody like you, but actually only few people got that height, right? So what do you think were the major qualities that you have that distinguish you from majority? All right, uh, Bill Warren, what, what makes you stand out from the crowd? <laughs> it's always interesting when Bill and I appear together, they, they don't figure they can do what Bill does, but they know they can do what I do. <laughs> <laughs> We did both have a passion for it. We were doing what we did because we loved it. We weren't doing it to get rich. We, we probably felt that if we did it well, we would get rich. But we, we'd have done it, you know, if somebody was slipping bread in under the door, you know, uh, to keep us going. And, and uh, so I think that passion for it uh, is enormously important. And I, I was lucky enough to have a couple of great teachers, particularly one great teacher. I, I had a great teacher about life and my father, but I had another great teacher in terms of a profession, in, in terms of Ben Graham. And so I... I was lucky enough to learn, get the right foundation very early on, and, and then basically I didn't listen to anybody else. I just, uh, uh, I look in the mirror every morning and the mirror always agrees with me, and you know, I go out and do what I believe I, I should be doing, and I, I, I'm not influenced by what other people think. It's an, and Bill, if you had to pick one thing that like, makes you stand out from everyone else, what would that be? Well, we've talked about some of the basics, having great people around you, reading a lot, uh, thinking long term. I also think, though, there become come a few magic moments where you have to have confidence in yourself. You know, Warren, when he set off on his own, he could have gone and taken a job as an analyst somewhere, but he knew that, that he had the skill, uh, that he was going to raise money and, and have his own partnership. When I dropped out of Harvard and said to my friends, come work for me, there was a certain kind of brash self-confidence in that. And you have a few moments like that where trusting yourself uh, and saying, yes, this, this can come together. You have to seize on those because not many come along. All right, great advice. Believe in yourselves. Guys, we're going to try and go into a cram session and get in some answers pretty rapid fire. So let's get right back here. We have a question. My name is Nikisha Alcindor. I'm from Roseville, New York. I'm a second year student here at the school. First, I just want to thank you guys for being great philanthropists. You guys have done a great job in the world. <laughs> My question is for uh, Mr. Buffett. You recently made a huge contribution to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. If you can talk to us a little bit about what your reasoning was and how you'd like to see those funds used. Yeah, well, I, I, I wouldn't have given it to them unless I was 100% in sync with their objective, which is to do the most good for the most people, wherever they may be, you know, male or female, whatever their color, whatever their religion, and so on. They, they, they believe every human life is equal to every other one. I'm very good at making money. If you read what Adam Smith wrote in 1776 about specialization of labor, you know, he says, if you're going to 
if you're going to deliver a baby, don't, don't try and learn to do it yourself. Get, a, get an obstetrician. So Bill and Melinda will be better, and, and my children, who also have foundations, will be better at doing it than I would be. And that's fine. I'll work at what I'm good at, and I'll let them do it. And they're doing it 100% in accord with my wishes. OK, another question right here. Mr. Buffett and Mr. Gates, welcome to Columbia Business School. My name is Chris. I'm from Pennsylvania, and I'm a first-year MBA student. My question is, who have been some of your most important mentors, and what lessons have you learned from them? Bill? Well, I benefited from my dad and mom, who set a, a great example. My dad was a lawyer and shared what he was doing at work. Uh, I've had some business partners that we've learned together, uh, Steve Ballmer in, in particular. And then I pick Warren as somebody I've learned an immense amount from. You know, just hearing his stories of how he dealt with tough situations, uh, how he thought long term, how he models the world. You know, if, if you get a chance to spend time with people like that, it's, it's fantastic. All right, we will be right back. Stay right here. Let's get right to it. You got a question? Yeah. Um, my, thank, uh, welcome. My name is Damian Matthews. I'm actually in the executive business school here. Uh, so thanks for coming here. My question is on Apple. Mr. Gates, if you could just comment and tell us what your thoughts are on the job Steve Jobs has done as the CEO of Apple. <laughs> well, he's done a, a fantastic job. You know, Apple's in a bit of a different business where they make the hardware and software together. But when Steve was coming back to Apple, which was actually through an acquisition of, of Next that he ran, Apple was in very tough shape. In fact, you know, most likely it, it wasn't going to survive. And he brought in a team. He brought in inspiration about great products and design uh, that's made Apple back into being an incredible force in doing good things. And it's, you know, it's great to have competitors like that. We write software for Apple. Microsoft does. They compete with Apple. Uh, but he you know, of all the, the leaders in the, the industry that I've worked with, he showed more inspiration and he saved the company. Okay, tag, you're it. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm a first year MBA student. Uh, the question's for Mr. Gates. I was wondering if you think uh, Google at all resembles Microsoft during Microsoft's early years. Oh, they have some of the same problems we had. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's another fine competitor. They're hiring a lot of smart people. They've gotten into the, the lead position in search, which is incredibly profitable to be number one in that. Uh, they may get a little competition as time goes forward. <laughs> but they're a, great, they're a great example of what can happen. You know, two young guys uh, who got, got together, pursued an idea, and, you know, created a success that's that's absolutely gigantic, and we all, uh, you know, hopefully use search engines, maybe a variety, uh, and uh, we'd benefit from that. Right here. Hi, I'm Josh Austin. I'm a second-year MBA student. My question's for you, Mr. Buffett. Uh, value investors such as yourself believe that fundamental analysis, deep fundamental analysis, is uh, critical to intelligent investing. However, uh, in, you've said several times in the past that um, uh, that uh, you've made very rapid capital allocation decisions, sometimes in less than five minutes. And I was wondering exactly which data gave you confidence in your decision. Yeah. Well, that's 50 years of preparation and five minutes of decision, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Can you just look at the spreadsheet? Can you look at a, an, a, an annual report and make a decision like that? I, uh, yeah, sometimes I can. I mean, just take Coca-Cola, for example. I mean, I, I, I sampled the product for 60 years, and then, then I saw a couple of key ingredients, you know, that uh, essentially uh, that, that tipped the scale in terms of, of, of buying it back in 1988. But the, the good, big decisions, they don't take any time at all. If they take time, you're in trouble. All right. We will have more with Bill Gates and Warren Buffett when we come right back. <laughs> Gentlemen, last question today. If America was a stock, would you buy it, Bill? Oh, you bet. 
Warren? On margin. <laughs> 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 All right, gentlemen, we want to thank you very much for your time. You've been wonderful, Bill Warren. We really appreciate it, both of them. Let's give them a big round of applause, guys.